Uh, Hal Lindsey, who wrote the great, great planet Earth, he predicted Christ's coming in 1988. Well, it didn't happen, but he said he'd search the scriptures and he didn't think was, that the United States was ever mentioned in scripture. And, uh, of course, they believe in Revelation, from chapter 4 on, that it's all future, but it has nothing to do with Christianity. They're going to, they're going to be raptured out, and uh, those who are lost, left behind, will have to suffer for uh, at least seven years. And I thought, what a tragedy that, uh, that these people believe this way, because they're going to be taken by a terrible surprise, and, and they're deceiving many people as to what, what's going to happen. So we need to remember our history, and remember that God will lead us in a clear path. <clears throat> and this is uh, from the Declaration, the second paragraph. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, before you can have happiness and the pursuit of it, and remember, this is a pursuit. It doesn't mean happiness. <laughs> uh, we have the pursuit of happiness if we have, number one, but, or before that, <clears throat> we, uh, we have to have liberty. Before that, we have to have life. Before that, we must have justification. And that's, let's go to Romans 5, uh, 518. We'll spend a little time in the book of Romans, verse 5, chapter 5. Uh, the um, verse 18 is a very fascinating verse. A lot of conflict over it, but if we take it just as it reads, we shouldn't have any problem. Uh, it says, and he's drawing a conclusion. Actually, this goes all the way back to verse 12. Maybe we can read that, and then we'll, then we'll take a look at uh, 18. <clears throat> verse 12 says that, um, therefore, another conclusion, just as through one man sin entered the world, death through sin, thus death spread to all men, because of all the sin. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm going to see if I can swallow this. You'll notice that in the last of the verse, verse 12, starting with verse 13, there's a, a parenthesis. That parenthesis goes all the way to the last of verse 17. Then he, he, ticks, he picks up the same thought that he had in verse 12. He, re, he repeats what he said, and then he draws his conclusion, the main point. And so in verse 18, Therefore, through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. And that that's, is a repeat of verse 12. And then he goes on to say, with the main point, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Justification always brings life. <clears throat> it can be spiritual life, sometimes mental, uh, sometimes it could be physical. But it does bring life, and uh, this is the basis for even for our Declaration of Independence. Justification, then life. From life comes liberty, then comes the pursuit of happiness. And <clears throat> now I want to go back to verse uh, 15. Uh, verse 15, let's, let's read it. 16 is good too, but uh, in this, Paul wrote, he says, the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense, and of course this is Adam, many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And then verse 16, and the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. And then, uh, yeah, that's probably enough for right now. Uh, <clears throat> then we're going to go back to uh, high school or uh, possibly grade school now, I don't know. Uh, uh, ratios and uh, proportions. Do you remember taking that in school? Mm -hmm. Here's one here. 1 is to 80 as 80 is to 6,400. Is this in proportion? Yes. And how do we, uh, I heard it, yes. Somebody's already got it figured out. Uh, we, we measure this by multiplying crossways. And so we take 1 is to 6,400, 
as 80 is, 80 times 80 is what? 6,400. So it's in proportion. 6,400. Now, 1 is to 80 as 80 is to E. Is this in proportion? He's a question mark, right? Question. No. Is this in proportion? No, E is the unknown. It's a, oh, yeah, okay. So many people ask, what do you mean by E? Well, it's eternity. Oh, wow. No, no more. This verse is so much out of proportion. The grace of God and justification is so out of proportion it cannot be measured with yeah. sin. It's so much greater than sin itself. And uh, we, did, we can't measure it. And this is from the NEB, the uh, New England Bible. Well, I think that's the name of got my mind thinking about it. God's act of grace is out of all proportion to Adam's wrongdoing. Yeah. For if the wrongdoing of that one man brought death upon so many, its effect is vastly exceeded by the grace of God. And that one man and the gift that came to so many by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. It's just, we can't measure it, but sometimes, you know, the devil tries to get us to think that, thinking that sin is greater than righteousness. It's not. It is not greater than, uh, than, uh, than God's grace. It's an impossibility. In fact, I think in, uh, yeah, in this verse, in chapter uh, 5, in verse uh, 20, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded, much more. In fact, that's a tremendous verse. But and the thing is, it's wherever sin abounds. If sin is abounding in our life, grace will much more abound in that very place. Yeah. Tremendous. Amen. And it, it's just uh, sin does not have a chance with God's grace. So long as we're connected to the life giver, which is Jesus Christ and His grace. Sin has no more dominion over us. And uh, it's interesting, if we go back to verse uh, 14, it says that death reigned, <clears throat> death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is the type of him who is to come. Moses was the first man who had ever come back from the dead. The devil claimed the grave as his prison house, which it was. And he tried to throw the king away. And that's why we read in June, the devil contended with Michael over the body of Moses. Amen. Because when Christ came to raise him from the dead, the devil protested. He said, mine. He belongs to me. My He's in my prison house. And Jesus didn't, rebuke, didn't uh, argue with him. He simply moved aside. Moses, come forth. <laughs> and Moses came out of the grave and God took him to heaven. And uh, that was number one, where the power of death was first broken with Moses. Yeah. Yeah, marvelous, but something even greater. Remember when, when uh, Jesus, when he died, the devil was going to make sure that he stayed in the grave. Uh, Pilate also, but the Jewish leaders. Christ said after three days he would be raised in the tomb. And uh, they were determined that they would, would uh, keep him in the grave. They put the big rock there, stamped it with the seal of Rome. It was impossible for Christ to get out of there from a human standpoint. But when two angels came from heaven, rolled the stone away, and one sat on it. I thought this was interesting. He sat on, the, on that stone. The other one went in and woke Jesus up. There was a hundred soldiers, and the Roman law was that if, if, a, if a prisoner escaped, your life was at, uh, at stake. And so these guys were running scared at that time because Christ had escaped. And, uh, but Jesus was demonstrating that a dead Savior is mightier than a living devil. <laughs> the devil could not. Now how much more Christ as a living Savior today? He has more power than the devil. The devil is, in fact, we're told by Ellen White that, that um, the, the weakest saint on their knees is stronger than all the hosts of hell. Amen. She doesn't use quite those, that language, but that's what she's dealing with. 
And as we as we trust totally, fully in Christ, uh, he, he will uh, more than, more than uh, make up for anything that's happened to us, and he will give us a victory. And sometimes the victory comes uh, slowly, but it will come. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but we need to remember, God's gift of righteousness in Christ, by grace, is so out of proportion with sin that it cannot be measured. We just can't do it. And we'll, we'll be studying this throughout eternity. Um, but the idea here in these verses we've been looking at, sin is condemnation for all men, just as many sins are to the one gift of justification of life for all men. The effect of Adam's one act of sin reaches all members of the human race. The effect of Christ's one act of righteousness on the cross reaches and covers all the sins of the human race. So in verses 18 and 19, Paul concludes his basic parallelism throughout, uh, between Adam and Jesus, which began in verse 12, we just touched on that, and the contrast then between verses 15 through 17. Now I want to come back to Christ also, of uh, uh, his obedience unto death. Maybe here, verse 19, as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. By one man's obedience. And here in, in Philippians 2, it's fantastic to also, it talks about the obedience of Christ from the time that he left heaven. He was in the form of God. He did not think it was robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of slain, and came in the likeness of men. He humbled himself. He was obedient even unto death. And uh, he'll be highly, highly exalted because of that. But uh, above angels, uh, as God, he was made a lower than the angels. And then he, uh, uh, he was made for the suffering of death. And this is evidence that he, he, if he had come as God, only as God, he could not have died. Had he come as angels who had never sinned, could he have died? Mm -mm. Not, not possible. Could he have died had he come as Adam before he sinned? Impossible. Well, angels are created beings. Uh, Pardon me? And angels are created beings. Uh, yeah, they're, they're created, but they're sinless. They, they yeah. can't die unless they sin. Well, yeah. what you just said, could he have died if he came in the nature of Adam before Adam sinned? Yes. Thank you. Yes. yes. And the answer is? No. That's why he had to take a dying nature. Amen. And that would be a nature that came after Adam had uh, fallen. A, a one woman called me and, and wept because she learned about Christ uh, taking, uh, or I, I just went through the, the, what I said here. Had he come only as God, no humanity, he could not have died. He could not have died if he come as a sinless angel, in the same nature of a sinless angel. Amen. could not have died. She wept because she realized that there is power in Christ because he, he came and took her place in her nature. Yes. You know, so, uh, and, and Christ depended on the Father as we must. Amen. He's the greatest example of righteousness by faith the universe has ever seen. Amen. And uh, so anyhow, he was made for the suffering of death. That's what uh, Paul wrote. Amen. And then it says, by grace he tasted death for every single one of us. Amen. There's not a one of us that has to die <laughs> eternally. Not in God's plan that we do that we do so. Uh, we do so if we insist. Um, but verse 19 also he says that he that we are made righteous by one man's obedience. Now I do believe that justification is a declaration, but it's more than that. It actually means to be made righteous by the power of God's word. And uh, in verse uh, 2 Corinthians 5:21. He made him who knew no sin, this is Christ, he was made to be, and we think of it, he was made to be sin itself for us. Yes? Gary, would you say that this is true at the incarnation? <laughs> Which? That the, uh, we were made righteous in Christ at the incarnation. Well, I believe he was the Savior then. Okay, that, um, that, I guess that's what I, I was asking. Yeah. Um, it wasn't a full-blown aspect. He had to die. Because right. we're, we're justified by his blood as well as uh, birth. But he was a savior when he came. Uh, 
Right. That's why the devil again tried to kill him, right, right, right from the get go. And uh, he knew something was different here. <laughs> it, it took him by surprise. Even though he had studied the Old Testament uh, prophecies, he tried to destroy the line that Christ. Uh, he tried to destroy the line that Christ came from. He got him down to one boy, <laughs> one baby. And uh, but the priest was uh, cognizant about it, and he said. We're going to save this baby. Kept him in the temple for what it was eight years, I think it was. Yeah. And through that, uh, the tribe of Judah began to multiply, and, and Christ was born. Wow. But the devil knew that somebody was up, and he, he couldn't do it then. But he tried all all along. In fact, if you look at the let's let's go uh, I hadn't thought of it. let's go to Romans not Romans but uh, Matthew chapter one, and just take a look at the genealogy of Jesus from the human side. Um, by the way, I was, I'm going to, I guess I can share this. Um, I was on a committee, a general council committee, actually, on uh, studying, we were supposed to be studying 1880 concepts. We never got around to it. Every time we, those guys told us, uh, they said, you tell us what we believe, we'll see if we agree with you. <laughs> and this went on for five years, and uh, just, it was terrible. But anyhow, we started in a, another one. Well, no, that was that one, I guess it was. The... Um, the chairman was general conference vice president, a wonderful man. And he told, after we got to studying about uh, righteousness by faith, he, he said one day, he said, you know, I want to tell you guys, he said, I'm on several, I think 30, 40, 50 different uh, committees as chair. He says, this is one of the, of the of every, everyone else. He's like, I get fed when I'm coming here. He said, I actually went back, went to my first district, first church and apologized to them for my legalism. <laughs> but anyhow, he, uh, he told us one day, he said, uh, uh, we're, we're going to study the uh, nature of Christ, the human nature of Christ next time. And they gave us a book, uh, Woody Wooden's uh, book on, uh, on the nature of Christ. And uh, so I read that thing about three times, I think. I'd studied it before, read it before. And I read it, wrote a paper on it. And it was on a Friday night. I gave the presentation. There was not a, not a sound, not a murmur, not a complaint, uh, not a negative, not a positive. And it puzzled me. And so uh, the next morning, uh, it was on Sabbath morning, we were going to continue the studies. And they were about ready to begin. I said, this minute, guys. I said, I've got a, I've got a question. I, I'm bothered about it something. I said, I gave a, a presentation on the nature of Christ last night. And I know there was not a one of you accepted it. <laughs> But I said, tell me what I did, what I did, what did I do wrong? Was it my premise, my conclusion, or my methodology in between? Absolute silence. And then the man who wrote the book screamed. You were screaming at me! <laughs> I said, Woody, I didn't raise my voice. No, your paper was screaming at me. <laughs> but I, I, took, I took his book and, and simply dealt with it. But the, the last part of his book, the index, is the best part of the book. He has a lot of quotations of my own life. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, we're still friends, I think, I mean, I mean, through, through the years. But, but uh, this is a hard one for people. It just, uh, um, and I actually, I used to fight it myself. Uh, I became an Adventist, and I asked the preacher one time about uh, what he thought about the nature of Christ. And I came from a Catholic background. I believe in the Immaculate Conception. And I believe it was because of the Immaculate Conception, Christ was made pure. And uh, so I believe that he couldn't, uh, that he could, that he would not, he could not sin. And uh, so the pastor told me, and he gave me the standard answer of an evangelical. And I said, oh, the Adventists are right. And we like the Catholics <laughs> on the Immaculate Conception. And it was years later, I was, in, uh, I was in college at the time. I'd been studying Jones and Wagner. And I was told by the guy that I was studying with, he said, everything is wonderful about Jones and Wagner, but he said, you, they're, they're wrong in this one point on the nature of Christ. And I said, okay. So every time I come to their writings, when I was reading their writings, I would jump over that part. <laughs> I don't want to get to the good part. <laughs> and this went on for several years. And when I was in college, there was a guy, he was a renegade teacher, and he finally left the Adventist church. And, but uh, he called himself Heresy Harris. And, uh, he, uh, I mean, this man was brilliant. He had three or four classes every day. He never brought a piece of paper with him. He had everything in his mind, and he would, he would simply talk from his mind, from what he had. And one day he, he was giving a study on the nature of Christ, 
and he was quoting Ellen White from the Tsar of Ages about the leopard, you know, that came to came to Christ. They tried to prevent him from touching Christ, and but they just the crowd just split, and he went up to went up to Christ, and, and Jesus touched him. And he, this teacher said, well, he's talking about the nature of Christ that he had. And I looked at that, but I went later, and I said, that isn't what she's saying. She was talking about us, that when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us, he is not polluted. And that made sense to me. It helped me, because I was, I was thinking that if Christ had a sinful fallen nature, that he would be polluted. It was just automatic to me, my thinking. But that was a crack that began in my mind to, to reassess this thing. I think it was nearly 10 years before I, I really came to grips with it. I studied it, but I tried to study both, uh, both uh, arguments. And uh, I remember one time traveling between uh, churches about 50 miles. So I had plenty of time to think. God had plenty of time working in my mind. And I remember, I, almost, I thought God was pushing me off the road. <laughs> it was decision time. And I've been putting this off for quite, you know, quite some time because I, I thought that maybe Christ had taken a fallen nation, but I did not want to accept it. But I pulled off the side of the road and I started praying and I said, God, it seems to me that Jesus took a sinful fallen nature. I'm going to accept it by faith. <laughs> and I got peace again uh, with him. And so I've been on that uh, ever since. And, uh, but anyhow, he was without sin. That means he had he did not commit a sin, yeah. and but then he says, he, uh, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him, it's not our righteousness. It's God's righteousness. It can be it cannot be separated from Jesus. When we accept Him, we receive all of His righteousness. It comes to us, credited to us, yes, but also He, he brings it into our own experience, yeah, and uh, I'm thankful for that. So we're not simply declared righteous, we are that, there's no doubt about it, but we are made righteous when we accept Christ by faith. And uh, those who, many of those who, who uh, believe that Christ took an unfallen nature do not believe that we're made righteous. Just, it, yes? I hate to keep interrupting you, Jerry. Yes, I, I, what, I was taught years ago that, that, that the Bible Oh. I don't talk very good at night. But what, what? It's kind of above and never on. Anyway, uh, what I was taught years ago, and it made perfect sense to me, was sin requires participation. Use the mic. If, I, if, if, if Jesus has a, has, he has my nature, but he does not sin because it requires in him a participation of sin. And that helped me a lot years ago. Yeah, okay, yes. There's a choice, and there's a... We can be crowded into it, but uh, even if we're crowded into it, God will take care of that, too. I mean, we, we may slip, but uh, we don't have to, but if we do, we, you know... Uh, I'm just talking about Jesus himself. Oh, yeah, right, okay. Yeah, he could not have slipped. <laughs> right, exactly. So, yeah. That's why I'm saying that, yeah. you know, saying he had my nature, but it requires participation for him to be a sinner, right. a verb sinner. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. All right, Galatians 2.20, the first part. I said, by the way, I, I think I saw a, a booklet out there by uh, W. Doug Prescott. Christ was crucified, or I was crucified with him. Amen. Yet I live. Yet not I. By the way, this is original. This is how it's in the original. It, it's uh, called envelope construction. It begins with Christ and ends with Christ. Christ I was crucified with, yet I live. Not I, but living in me, Christ. And I see you have a little booklet out there. When it first, I read this many years ago when I, when I first started studying uh, the 1880 message. And then uh, there was a lawyer in California that, that uh, had the book, or had, had it printed in booklet form. And I looked at it, there were so many uh, mistakes. It was it, to me. It was just terrible, <laughs> page after page. And I talked to him about it. Probably two or three years after it had been published, I said, "Why did you publish it like this? And why didn't you have an editor clean it up?" And he said, "I'll tell you how it came about." He said, "I was studying with a man in prison, and that man wanted to do something, 
and he gave him the material that uh, Prescott had written, and that prisoner had written it, uh, had, had put it down in long hand, and then uh, taped, typed it. And so there were many, many errors in it. But when this man told me that, I said, oh, that's fantastic. Doesn't matter how many errors. <laughs> I mean, the colonel was there. But, uh, but I, thought was, I thought it was just negligence that they had done it. They probably should have had an editor run, it, run through it after it had been already written. But, but when I learned that it was a conversion of a, of a prisoner, I thought, well, so what? You know, God takes care of mistakes, too. So. But you need to remember that we are covered by the righteousness of Christ. And we're filled with his righteousness on the inside. And we grow up in that. And so Galatians 2.20 says, the last part of it, the life which I now live in the flesh, <clears throat> I live by the faith, it should be the faith of the Son of God. This is the New King James. The Old King James is right. Of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is a tremendous contrast. No matter how great human sin becomes, God's grace super abounds beyond it and abundantly exceeds it. <clears throat> sin is only temporary. God's righteousness is eternal. And uh, this is the righteousness, the justification, the faith of Jesus that gives us life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is how we remember the Declaration of Independence. First, there's justification. Then there's life. Then there's liberty. Then there's the pursuit of happiness. It's, I tell you, it's a marvelous message. And I think the, the, uh, even the uh, declaration is tremendous. Uh, now, uh, both Thomas Jefferson and Roger Williams used metaphors to illustrate the separation between church and state. Williams' metaphor was this. There must, there must be a wall or a hedge of separation between the wilderness of the world in the garden of the church. So he's the one that brought out um, in the mid-1600s about the separation of church and state. And he, he followed this in his, his practice in Rhode Island. And then Jefferson, years later, after he was president, he was writing to the Danbury, Connecticut uh, Baptist. And he said There's a, there should be a wall of separation between church and state. And he was talking about how the Declaration came about and the Constitution. So these two men are uh, were solid with, their, with the metaphors of separation. This man, years later, he was in 1985, <clears throat> uh, he was a senior Supreme Court Justice, and he wrote his opinion that the wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history. It should frankly and explicitly be abandoned. Now this is a, a justice, the Supreme, he was the head of the Justice Department of the Supreme Court. And he was making that kind of a statement in 1985. But there are others who just that, that cannot stand that idea, and they would like to do away with it, uh, both Christians and non-Christians. The Declaration of Independence expresses specific concepts upon which the United States was founded, and the reasons for separation from Great Britain. And I use this as a metaphor, <laughs> uh, bookends that are uh, used in libraries, all over the world they have to keep books nice and neat and straight and uh, standing straight so we can look at them. And the work of God is like bookends to, uh, keeping the Declaration standing straight and tall, nice and tidy, and on display for everyone to see. And so I put this as a visual, the <clears throat> Declaration of Independence between two bookends. The bookends of God. The first, the first couple of Paragraphs talk about God and about the Creator. But this is the first one. The last paragraph pictures him as Supreme Judge. And God is mentioned uh, at least four times. There are a couple other times that might be also. He's mentioned as God, as Creator, as Supreme Judge, and Divine Providence. I remember sharing this with some friends of mine who were a preacher. And he went and looked at it and said, Yeah, oh, you're right. So he, I don't think he'd ever read the, the uh, Declaration. But there are 27 grievances in the Declaration. They're all listed against uh, King George. Uh, <clears throat> abuses. And now, uh, some have said that, uh, w that we went to war, the war of separation, because of taxes. That was only one offense. It was minor to, to all the rest that they were uh, against. And here's some of them. Representative powers, 11 times. 
the king had uh, had come down against um, people uh, as representatives. Military powers seven times were abused. Judicial powers four times. Stirring up domestic insurrection. These are all in the declaration as you go through it. Abuses listed in the declaration again. Taxation without representation only one time. It's, uh, I would say it was the least of, of, uh, of the other ones. Um, the Declaration of Independence was written not merely for economic reasons. See, this is what people are tying it to. But, uh, they're saying it was only economic. It was not. It was spiritual. And we need to remember that. And here's King George. And uh, <clears throat> some of the signers said they were pursuing religious liberty. The king would not allow these people to have Bible societies. They wanted to have them in the state. They would start them and they'd be shut down. <laughs> Samuel Adams and Charles Carroll were signers of the Declaration and religious freedom was their reason for joining the revolution. And the king vetoed American missionary societies. He demanded an established church, which would be his church, the Church of England, to be supreme over all of them. There were colonies that voted anti-slavery laws. Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, and a couple other ones in the north. And they were all vetoed. They established religious liberty laws. He vetoed <coughs> them. And then uh, Pennsylvania voted to end slavery in 1774. King George uh, vetoed <coughs> colonial anti-slavery laws. Wow. Now, because the British Empire was involved in slavery, so also the American colonies, as part of the empire, were forced to use slavery. They would have shut it down. And even those who held slaves after the Constitution, or after the Declaration, uh, including uh, Jefferson, they would have given them up. Uh, they wrote strongly about it. The, uh, here, here's another man <clears throat> by the name of Lawrence who proclaimed, I am for slavery. I was born in a country where slavery had been established by British kings and parliaments ages before my existence. Thomas Jefferson wrote a 168-word passage. I think I read it last uh, couple of nights ago. I'm not going to do it again. But uh, that, that condemned slavery as one of the many evils forced upon the colonies by the British crown. The passage was cut from the final wording. And this is a picture of that uh, original draft. Um, in that initial draft was a passage that condemned slavery as one of the many, oh, I mentioned, foisted upon the colonies, and it was cut from the Declaration. And this is what, part of what he said. He, he has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of liberty and life in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating them, and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere or to incur miserable death in their transportation thither. He's talking about slave trade from Africa to the United States. And uh, the justification by faith and liberty of conscience and the uh, U.S. Declaration of Independence, this is, this is a join. These people understood this. Most of them were born again. Now, some of them were deists, but even the deists believed in separation of church and state. And, uh, they would rather, I think, accept Christ than go the direction that uh, the king wanted to go. I read, I read this one, a part of it last time, the same thing uh, Prescott wrote about an unpalatable doctrine, which is justification. The time will soon be here when it will be practically as unpalatable the truth to tell them, speaking of uh, fallen Protestantism, that there is life and salvation in Jesus Christ. To tell them that they do not know anything about justification by faith. That's quite a thought. Um, some of the admins talking to these people <laughs> this way. Um, but it's, it's going to be true. There are many, there are many points that we can agree with, with uh, evangelicals. Uh, but the one saved, always saved concept is not one of them. And uh, I, I guess I can. Uh, can uh, Give a, another experience I've had with a preacher. Uh, we were meeting together, a group of us. I don't remember how many or what kind, but uh, we met in a, with a Methodist. And he was supposed to give us uh, an outline of what the Methodists believe. And he said, uh, I don't know what to say. He said, you guys know everything we know. And uh, 
So he said, I guess we'll open up for questions. And there was silence. So don't me, ask the question. <laughs> I said, tell us, uh, tell us about the, uh, the teaching of Wesley that had to do with, uh, with overcoming sin, the second blessing. He said, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> And there was a guy, a holiness man, who hated Adventists, especially preachers. He was there. And he said, I have had that experience. Uh, I've had the second blessing. He, he no longer sinned. And I thought, this is interesting, because I knew he had a hard time with me. And uh, we were in another meeting with some businessmen, and he was giving a study on the fourth commandment of all things. And uh, he was telling, he never went to the Ten Commandments at all. He went to Leviticus, a couple places in Leviticus try to join them together with health and welfare, that we have a good Sunday law for our health, that type of thing. And I sat there, I didn't want to interrupt him, I didn't want to disagree with him, but on the other side, well, I was sitting back here, and on the other side, a, an Anglican priest spoke up, well, what about our Seventh-day Adventist brethren? <laughs> Absolute silence. I still didn't say anything. And he, but this guy, he picked up and continued to talk about what he believed. And uh, then the Catholic priest raised his hand. He says, what about our Adventist brother? And then I spoke. <clears throat> I said, listen, uh, it's wrong to have man's law enforcing God's law. It doesn't matter if it's uh, Sabbath or Sunday. It would be wrong for us to demand that the government uh, enforce the seven-day Sabbath. And he was mad. But it, 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 it broke him up. He, he wouldn't speak. And so that's some of the background I'm, I'm talking about. He was, he was head of the ministerial department or uh, group in that city. And uh, our next meeting was at the uh, public hospital. And the first thing out of his mouth was, he said, we need to have a group of preachers go through all the books and take out the books that we don't like. Well, I knew that, <laughs> I knew that uh, Uncle Arthur had some books in there, <laughs> the Bible stories. And, bedtime stories, and I, but I didn't want to defend them because I, you know, I knew that, well, I wasn't afraid of arguing with them. Well, I didn't know I didn't want to argue with them, but I knew it would cause a, a terrible rift, so I kept my mouth shut. There's a little old nun sitting next to me. She says, oh, we can't get rid of Uncle Arthur's Bible stories. <laughs> and then I spoke up. I said, you know, um, I'm not going to defend our literature, but I am going to defend the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons because they have literature in there too. I said, I don't believe as they do, but they have a right to have their literature in this public uh, place unless administration says no. And I said, we don't need a preacher patrol getting rid of literature. This man exploded. There was shrapnel all over the place. <laughs> and this is a man who did not sin. <laughs> you know, so, so I said, I really started praying for him. I said, Lord, he's got the wrong attitude. <laughs> and I started praying for him, and he got sick. And that gave me an opportunity. I bet it beat a pathway to the hospital to pray with him. Or I asked him, I said, would it be all right if I prayed with you? He said, yeah. He didn't know what the, what the problem was. I think God put him in the hospital. I really do. <laughs> because uh, as, I, as I left, I prayed for him. And then I later left him with a little booklet called uh, The Problem of Human Suffering by Paul Hubeck. It's a wonderful little book, booklet. And I gave that to him and left. Do you know that after he got out of the hospital, and within a few weeks, he called me. He said, Jerry, would you preach in my, in my, in my uh, for, for me? So I'm going to be out of town. Would you preach for me? He said, absolutely. <laughs> I did it twice. He asked me twice. He knew that I, wouldn't, I wasn't going to steal a sheep unless I could. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> but, but anyhow, he, was, he came to our, host, our house before we left. And he said, uh, Jerry, he said, you know, I've had no, no use for Seventh-day Adventists, especially preachers. But he said, somehow God has uh, entwined our heartstrings together. <laughs> I said, yeah, I believe so. He said, can I pray for you uh, before you leave? I said, absolutely. <laughs> so I'm hoping that we can be together in heaven. I don't know if that's the last time I ever saw him. But, but, uh, but I, there was a change. I could see a change in that. He, he hated it. There's no doubt he hated it. And he was sinless, according to his own, his own uh, decree. But uh, anyhow, because some of them believe that if you... If you've been saved, it doesn't matter what you do, you're still saved and, and it's not counted against you. you know? So uh, it's amazing. Did I, did I share a little? I think I shared the one here, didn't I? About the uh, Sunday school teacher that uh, her, her pastor said from the pulpit that, that he could, he could uh, 
community see them and still be saved. You, you know, I didn't share with that. Oh, there was a better share that one. Um, she, this teacher talked to me about it, and uh, she, she said that the teacher, or the priest, preacher said he was once saved, always saved. And uh, so, uh, she talked to her husband about it, and he said, well, you better, she, you must have misunderstood what he said. You better, you know, contact him and find out for sure. So she did. And he said, I'm telling you, I could go, I could be, murder someone through premeditation, could murder the person, and I could not be lost. I go to heaven. And she said, well, I can't, uh, she, I'm going to have to resign from teaching these children. He, she was one of the best teachers they had. And so he said, oh, no, you don't have to do that. He said, we can, you know, uh, you can teach what you want. And, and she said, I can't. She said, uh, you're saying one thing in the pulpit, and I can't accept that. And I'm going to teach something else. And she says, going to be nothing but confusion in the minds of little kids. So she said, I'm quitting. And she did, to her credit. And, uh, and I've run into these before. I, in fact, I'm going to tell you one more, and then we probably ought to quit for soon. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, anyhow, this is a, um, it was a confrontation that a homosexual had with me. And um, <clears throat> have you ever been discouraged? Uh, I, I pulled up behind a, a, uh, some bushes in a park. I used to walk in a park and get some exercise in a beautiful park. But this day, I didn't want to walk. Oh, I went, I, oh she didn't shut the door. I, I didn't realize it was some kids. Well, I'm not going to get into the details. Uh, oh. uh, but anyhow, as uh, I pulled up behind these trees, and a guy in a pickup pulled in alongside of me. And we got to talking, you know, in front of you proposition. And I got mad. And I, I doubled my fist, and I put it on the front of the seat, and my Bible was right there, and I hit the Bible. And as soon as I, my, my mind went to God and said, God, I don't know what's going on, but help me, <laughs> give me words to say, whatever. And uh, so we, we got to talking back and forth, and he said, uh, he asked me, he said, well, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm a gospel worker. And so that gave me an opportunity to ask him what he did. He said, you'll never believe this. And he turned a kind of shade to green. <laughs> And he said, you won't believe this, but I'm a preacher. And I said, oh, the plot thickens. And so he said, why don't you come over to my, uh, my truck and we'll talk. I said, no, I'm not going to. You come over to mine. I want to be in control. I didn't tell him that. He got in, he got in the front seat, and he reached in the back seat. I had a desire of, his, uh, desire of ages. He opened it up, closed it, put it back. It wasn't interested. He picked up my Bible, and he turned to the book of Romans. He said, oh, you're all right. And so that was, began the conversation. And he told me, he said, what he was afraid of, that God was going to kill him and take him to heaven, make his wife and kids suffer for his sin. And I came a little bit unglued. And I said, what kind of God are you serving? And he said, I'm saved. I said, you're lost. And he got about that far from my nose, and we were not kissing. <laughs> He just screamed, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. I said, you're a lost man and you're going straight to hell. <laughs> and he just sank in the seat. He just completely uh, exhausted from it. And then I started giving him the Bible study on the, well, I did it on the, uh, the cities of refuge. And I said, you know, God has provided for, for us, just as he did with the cities of refuge. Uh, if a person kills someone, um, and he, 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 if he could run and get to that city of refuge within about a half a day of the distance between them, he was safe. He'd have a trial and find out if it was premeditated or whatever. But so long as he stayed within the city, the avenger could not touch him. Amen. If he went outside the city, then he, the brother or the avenger could take his life. I said the devil is our avenger. And we have sinned. And he has claims on our life. But if we run to Christ, who is our city of refuge, so long as we remain in him, he cannot touch us. And this guy, he finally began to see some things. And uh, I was pretty hard on him. Uh, not so much from his approach to me, but what he was talking about his wife and family. And he told me, he said, you know, I've seen tens of thousands of young people come to Christ through my ministry. And he was a television personality back east. 
and uh, he started to say his name. He, he invited me to come out to his church, and uh, but he said uh, he started to say his name, and he, said, and he just turned shades of green again. I said, "Don't worry, I'll never mention your name uh, in this situation." He said, "Yeah, but you've got a you've got a testimony you can give. I don't have one." <laughs> <laughs> that seemed to be all he was thinking about, I guess. But uh, uh, he seemed to seemed to be on another path, and he said he wanted to contact me again, but he never he never did after that. But uh, but I believe the power of God. In fact, I want to go I want to go to uh, First Corinthians. Um, first, uh, first Corinthians, I think it's chapter six. It's a powerful statement for people. Um, and especially today, we're, we're living in a time when every sin imaginable is being committed and is being taught in our public school system. And I've seen some books that were that are absolutely abhorrent to grade school kids. No Christian should have a child in the public school system. It is, they're totally corrupt. It's absolutely amazing. But here's, here's one in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that should give some hope to people. And uh, the, uh, probably about verse, uh, well, verse, verse 9. Yeah. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor righteous, Covetous, rather, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And then this next sentence, and such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is involved in justification as well as sanctification. And the last part of it, in fact, uh, you're uh, justified by the Spirit of God. And so there's, there's good news for them if they're willing, willing to respond. And it doesn't matter where a person comes from. But, uh, but today we're in, a, we're in a pickle of having to deal with this. And we're going to have to deal with it more. We may be threatened um, with uh, church leadership. Uh, we can expect anything. But as we stand, if we stand on the word of God, God will see us through. Amen. But the power of God is there for anyone, it doesn't matter who they are, uh, to, uh, to grab hold of God's promises. He will deliver anybody from any sin. It doesn't matter what they've done, where they're at. He will reach down and change them marvelously. I think it's wonderful. But anyhow, looks like we ran out of time. <laughs> out of the message. Uh, well, your message is back up. Pardon me? Did you have some more slides to show us? Oh, yeah, but I, yeah, but I got, yeah. yeah <laughs> I, you know what I, th I thought of doing? I thought, you know, because this is sleepy time, um, I want to relate an experience that I had a little over about two years ago now. I nearly died. Yeah. And I'd like to share, if, I, if, if you don't mind, no, no. Uh, this is, I told God that whenever I have an opportunity, I'd share it. And I, didn't, I thought maybe this was an opportunity. <laughs> we'll see. Um, I had a, you're familiar with a colonoscopy, and uh, they found a, a polyp in my intestine about the size of a dollar, flat. Yeah, usually they look like a mushroom, you know, they can snip them off and take them off. And then he couldn't get to this one. And so he recommended to me be, to go into surgery. And I didn't want to, but uh, finally decided, he, said, he said it does not look cancerous, but what we tested, there's no cancer, but he said we can't, we can't test it on the underside. And uh, so I decided to go ahead. The, the, the uh, surgery was a success, but after it was done, I started bleeding internally. And it was so bad that they were pumping blood into me as much as they could. And, uh, and then they sent in two, two teams led by two doctors to keep me alive. <laughs> I didn't know much of what was going on, but I found out later. But before I went in, I made things right. I had some things I need to get right with people. I wasn't thinking, you know, dying. I didn't think it would be a major thing. But uh, there's a picture of yours truly with all kinds of 
the hoses in me. And uh, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, okay. Uh, here's one they took out of me through my nose. I think this was through my nose. It was about three feet long. And uh, I was on a ventilator two or three times. I don't remember how many times it was, but uh, this is, they, they really fixed it up. But the principal function of a ventilator, a ventilator, as you know, is to pump or to blow air into your lungs and then uh, take uh, take stuff out. And it uh, removes carbon dioxide as well. And that's why it's called ventilation. So here is uh, there's a picture of me half dead. And uh, here's how they test you for, for uh, uh, COVID. Uh, here's a, another one of the lady. It shows a cutaway. Uh, how, how this happened to me several times, and they couldn't find any COVID. Um, but they, and I didn't even know they were doing it. But they, they were making tens of thousands of dollars on me just, just to test. <laughs> they send in a report, and they get back you know, no COVID. But they still got the money for it. And they got the bright idea that I still had COVID, and so they sent me down to the COVID floor. And they were going to they were going to test me again. And there was a young doctor. I could, I heard him. I woke up, and I heard him saying, "Let him go. Let him alone. He doesn't have it." <laughs> and so that stopped it. They moved me up to the main floor. And uh, but anyhow, that was quite an experience. And something happened though, and I don't even know the, the chronology of this thing. But sometime during uh, after the operation, and I saw you know like on the lower third of a, a television screen or computer, they call it the lower third, and on, the, on my left hand side I saw it looked like a brain was exploding, and then another, the earth was just, just falling apart. And I looked at that, and then there was a mist coming out of there, and then a message came, and it said, whoops, 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 you will not make it through this. Okay? Then, shortly after that, another message come on the right-hand side in a beautiful blue pennant. She says, you're going to come through this. <laughs> and then, two passages of Scripture, Psalm 103, 2 and 3. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget all of his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities and heals all your diseases. Amen. And then Psalm 118. This is David's experience, verses 18 and 17. The Lord has not given me over to death. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Amen. Those gave me a whole lot of comfort. <laughs> but I was not afraid to die. That, I mean, that was not, uh, I, I, I thought I might die before this, and, uh, and I was ready whatever God's will was. And, uh, but I woke up the next day, I don't know if it was the next day or the day after, I don't know, time was gone for me. But I saw something like this. There was a. I thought I would wake up, and I. I, I don't believe you go immediately to heaven, but I thought it would be like going to sleep and waking up because <laughs> uh, we're told that, that uh, that's the way it is. So I thought when I wake up, I'm going to be in heaven. <laughs> and and uh, but I, I looked and I looked around. I saw I saw the television. I saw the clock. And this gray wall. I'm not in heaven. I'm still here. <laughs> So, so I was rejoicing somewhat of that, but I could not talk. I could mumble in a growl voice. It was terrible. And uh, the doctor came in. Well, Shirley was in the, uh, the two doctors, uh, Don and Esther, were trying to get me out of the hospital. And uh, they, they wanted to put me in a, in a uh, rest home or rehab because I couldn't walk and couldn't talk and couldn't feed myself. And they wanted to get me out of there, I think, before I died. <laughs> so, but the doctor came in and he said, well, we've got a choice to either send you to rehab or, or other, another place or to send you home. What do you want to do? And I grunted, I want to go home. And he said, well, I guess we're going to have to step out in faith and send you home. <laughs> so surely my daughter came and got me and had to wheel me out and lug me around and get me, uh, um, get me in the house. There's, that's when I was walking. Here's a picture of me walking. Shirley hanging on to me, or I was hanging on to her, I guess. <laughs> and here's a picture of my daughter uh, standing there with me, too. Uh, I could only walk about two feet. Uh, I couldn't talk. I couldn't feed myself. I sat in a chair, and then evidently my daughter thought I was going to die because I just I didn't, there was no life there. <laughs> so 
and Shirley was feeding me with a spoon. I don't know how many days, do you remember how many days you, you fed me? I don't either, but I remember one day I woke when I was, uh, I took the spoon out of my hand, started feeding myself. And then I was able to walk to the table to eat breakfast, I think it was the first meal I had. But I could only walk about uh, three or four minutes, and I was completely exhausted. My voice was gone, and we had people coming into the, into the house uh, for a month or two, uh, physical therapists, nurses, and she wasn't a voice specialist, but she helped around the house. But she knew that I was having trouble, trouble speaking, and she said, uh, you need to start humming. She says, that'll strengthen your vocal points. So sure, Shirley and I went home. <laughs> and uh, almost a year. I, I'll tell you what, I, I started singing three, three, uh, three weeks ago. First time we've sung over a year. And, I, and this is a congregation. Now, it was kind of up and down, gravelly, <laughs> no tune. But I was able to do it. And I noticed here, I've been able to sing some of the songs here. So, <laughs> so I think it's on the men. But hemming, uh, humming, humming, I humming. Mean, Humming does help and uh, strengthen me. And legs, I couldn't walk. I think uh, I could never walk more than uh, two blocks. I was staggered like a drunken man. And uh, Shirley said, or I told Shirley, I said, I hope a cop doesn't stop me because <laughs> it's taking me in for staggering. You know? But little by little, uh, it's, been, it's been coming. But we thank God for what he's done. I, I, I praise him. Uh, I'm, he's not done with me. He's got some things he's got to work out of me. <laughs> Uh, before I kick the bucket, I guess. But uh, anyhow, that's my experience, and I'm going to stick to it. <laughs> so, so, but I thank God for His goodness to us. Uh, we're all we're all in the same boat, and uh, sometimes we have a paddle, and sometimes we don't. But uh, but I know that God He wants to save us. There's not a sh I have no no doubt in my mind, and if we let Him, we will be saved. I want to be there. Amen. You too. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you again for your goodness to us. You promised to never let us go. We to claim that promise. May we trust Christ the best that we know how. And I know that you'll teach us step by step. Thank you in his name. Amen. 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 Amen.